Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, our little discussion on um, network modeling for neuroscience data. Um, I Obviously, you guys are here. You must uh, uh, dabble in network modeling or have a real interest in how we understand the brain as a system, as a distributed system, how it communicates um, over white matter fiber pathways, how function functional information is transmitted over them, um, how those networks uh, behave, and how they miss behave in, um, in diseases like Alzheimer's disease, autism spectrum disorder, Parkinson's disease, and many other uh, systems. Um, network modeling is particularly uh, of interest, I know, to myself, um, to colleagues like Teague Henry um, and Heman Shakiri. Um, many of, of the rest of you are also probably very interested in um, these networks. Um, multiple different data types uh, lend themselves to being able to uh, look at these um, types of model, these forms of modeling, um, structural um, kind of connectivity based uh, methods using diffusion weighted um, uh, diffusion tensor imaging data, for example, um, functional connectivity, looking at uh, patterns of, of function across the brain using functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, EEG, um, and then uh, is another one to look at, and many others that um, can lend themselves to helping to parameterize those models and to understand what happens to them um, in some of those diseases which we mentioned. So what I want to do is um, I want to get your ideas about where we might be strong, what things might we might look at, and how we might be participatory in whatever the NIH, for example, has coming up uh, in the future. There's one thing before we get started is that I really think that the computational neurosciences is fundamentally important to our success and our eventual preeminence. Um, we are the kind of the glue, the people who do this work are kind of the glue for all of these different areas to interoperate across grounds um, to help form interesting collaborations and generate novel ways to um, analyze and understand these data. Um, being competitive in this space in terms of being able to get grants is vital. Um, the NIH has a number of large-scale grants um, that seem to come up all the time, and it would be wonderful to be poised to be able to launch either research cores or be principal drivers of those research projects um, as they come up. And so um, figuring out how we can integrate our own uh, talent and tools here would make us very responsive to large-scale U and P class grant mechanisms that the NIH has involved uh, coming up. So what I want to do is share my screen and uh, we can, I can just take some notes here um, as people are free associating. <laughs> and uh, uh, let me just find my uh, the thing that I started here. Bear with me. Here we go. And I'm just going to start taking notes. So um, I, I don't know how we want to start this. Um, I know that um, uh, there are a number of you who are probably already interested in this, and maybe um, maybe I could just invite Teague Henry to give us a little insight and, and uh, inspiration as we start our conversations. Teague, do you have anything you want to comment on? Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking about kind of what the what the current state of the art in terms of network modeling is, and this is of course biased through my own view of the research, but I see kind of two major components. One is uh, the use of multi-layer modeling to unite different modalities of neuroimaging. So that is taking, of course, functional structural EEG, um, PET imaging, any sort of imaging, and then using multi-layer methodology to effectively construct one network consisting of a series of networks to then analyze. That is a, a very, very current topic in network science that is very, very popular, um, and there's a lot of work going on in it, and it can be very, very useful for looking across these different modalities. There's also a consideration of how to construct networks in uh, a given neuroimaging modality. So I specialized in functional connectivity, uh, which there are many different ways of doing it, um, but there's also, of course, DTI, white matter tractography, um, as well as how do you construct intelligible networks in um, PET imaging or in other modalities um, that exist. So those are the two kind of general topics that I, I see as kind of major research areas. Um, so Teague, you had multi-layer modeling and, and what, what would you, how would you? Uh, the second one was network construction. Network construction, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah.
Don't mind my spelling as I'm trying to type in real time here. Excellent. Um, thank you, Teague. Um, I know uh, Heeman Shakiri does a lot of work in the multi-layer modeling. And um, Heeman, uh, maybe you'd be able to comment on kind of some of the um, vision that you've had or experience you've had with uh, the creation of multi-layer models that might be applicable to brain-related data. Well, I've done a lot of theoretical like graph algebra study here and uh, looking at different. So here, my understanding is Tig is referring to this multiplex kind of modeling because of a different type of information that overlay on top of each other. Uh, I, I really like this because this way we can include different type of data, which can be a discussion in the other breakout room that we basically want to pinpoint this different frequency of this different type of data to study the dynamics that is running in the brain because we have these different proxies of this neural activity. We cannot directly measure them. And these different proxies can help us pinning down the dynamics. And the, di the dynamic of the brain is very complex. Sometimes we cannot uh, find an e easy lower dimensional uh, representation for that. But with this, we can, we can do this. We can study the dynamic using this multi-layer modeling. But if we only look at one type of proxy, it will be very difficult because of this chaotic behavior of the brain. So that's why I like this uh, approach for to study the dynamic here, the dynamic of the brain, to have a structural representation, like a causal representation. So this is very challenging because it's not a mere statistical analysis. Uh, that we, if we have infinite data, we can, we can have a good probabilistic understanding. Here we like to know what if we, we make a change. In that case, what will happen? So this causal structure uh, can be done using this multi-layer model, right? What kind of um, mathematics? I mean, if you, if, without getting too mathematical, what kind of mathematics uh, do um, you know? Do we need to be skilled in in order to be able to um, conduct these kind of an analytics? Well, uh, as I said, having this description that basically with the lower order model we can understand uh, these changes in the brain. Uh, so I'm I'm looking at operator theory here to have. Uh, this basically this different choice of observable here from this measurement. So functions of these measurements uh, that can help us better understanding this evolving dynamic. Uh, so uh, we work on a very similar topic with Teague and Jack on this. Uh, also because of the, the mathematics was uh, kind of we need to develop that. Initially, we targeted NSF for that, but I'm sure there will be a lot of trickling down to uh, NIH problems uh, that NIH is more interested in. So to include data to go backward to solve this inverse problem. So I see something in the chat. Yes, control theory, because we want to have this mechanistic understanding of the brain, not just like a correlation understanding. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's, uh, that's the next step. I think a lot of the work that's been done in um, network modeling to date, at least in, in practice, where I'm coming at this from like, you know, uh, functional connectivity modeling with uh, fMRI, for example, very correlative, right? We're looking at correlations between one spatial area and the time course in another spatial area and making inferences about connectivity. But we kind of, that's nice, but we kind of need to go more than that. And so I, I love these ideas of kind of multi-layer, multiplex, or bringing multiple different data types together to help describe these uh, systems. So you could have structural connectivity with measured with diffusion tensor imaging on top of that. Uh, so that tells you kind of like where this, the street map, 
but it doesn't tell you anything about the traffic, right? And functional MRI or EEG or other um, data types that are more sensitive to the time varying dimensions of these things tell you about the traffic flowing over the street map and bringing that together and then having control systems theory to figure out how you can throttle things or looking at uh, dynamical systems uh, will be very vitally important, I think, as we're trying to understand what, hap what happens in health and what breaks down in disease. Um, may I, may I uh, add something, please? As long as absolutely, you certainly may, Chris. Thank you. So I'm Chris Barrett. I'm from the Biocomplexity Institute. So the, there's this issue of the connection to the theoretical computer science as well, and uh, for causal description. Um, there are deep connections, of course, between automata and controls, um, mm -hmm. you know, time series filtering and, and adaptive systems and stuff. But, but algorithms also uh, connect here. There's, we have a, we study a collection of things, for example, called graphical dynamical systems as a broad class. Um, they uh, directly pertain to this. Their scalability is a really um, very difficult issue. One of the things that comes up in neurological data and other data, traffic data, I mean, you speak of traffic, I mean, like real traffic data, yeah. cars, uh, is that um, you, you actually, you, you play this uh, balance between um, sort of asymptotic models um, and sort of what's going on in the dynamics at this moment. Um, because the data you collect, after all, when you put an electrode, say, in a piece of tissue is actually quite aggregated. I mean, it may be small compared to the whole brain, but it's actually a very um, aggregated thing. So, so there's not just um, hierarchies in that sense of, of um, multi-layered networks, but there's, there's, there's aggregation layers in the, in the underlying data itself and how to stick these things together um, there are also topological issues, and we brought up algebra. Um, there are um, issues associated with just basic representation um, that um, we deal with in things like um, sequence to structure mappings on, on, on RNAs, that, but nevertheless, the mathematical representational issues are very, very similar in some respects. I mean, they're completely different in others, but the, so there's lots of methods uh, so the summary of this is there's really a lot of information science and, and theoretical, you know, like mathematical style work that is uh, essential to be brought to bear uh, to understand what these large networks are. They're, from a computer science point of view, almost every question you can answer in some formal sense is intractable. You can't find paths, you can't, you know, so there's, you have to like be very careful how you sort of slice these things to get these problems in a form um, that really, you know, sing. And I, I think that this, this part of the work could be quite distinguishing. Um, it's also coming of age, so it would also be part of the like things moving forward, but I just really uh, wanted to add the, um, I guess I'll say computer and information sciences to the theoretical part of this, uh, which uses algebra, which uses all this other stuff, but, but is focused in that direction. That's very important is to be thinking. I, I love that, Chris. Thank you for sharing that. That's uh, the, the notion of the, the topological notion, which we sort of alluded to. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. And we haven't, I'm not really sure that people have fully explored this with uh, like a lot of neural data just yet, but very often, um, things become simpler if you project them into some sort of alternate topology. So if you can project things onto a Ramanian manifold, for example, then all of a sudden the math becomes you know, different um, and sometimes more interesting. And being able to have some sort of a sense of how um, networks play out over manifolds or alternative spaces rather than just in a Euclidean space is, is often very uh, interesting and, and uh, informative. Um, I'm sure that Teague and uh, Heman would, would tend to agree. Also, just like something I left out, I just want to say this, things like networks of oscillators or oscillating networks. Yep. Um, and, and these graphical dynamical systems are, are, are exactly what they say at each vertex. Uh, well, there's a duality issue here, but there's at each vertex, there's, a, there's, a, there's an algorithm and they pass values over edges. I mean, that's, it's abstract. That's right. And, and, and these dynamics are, are, are fundamental to all kinds of problems, but specifically to neuroscience, it would be really wonderful to 
to find a home like that. Absolutely. And one thing that uh, is that's a very, a very good point is that the, the different nodes in these networks are, you know, they're distinct on the one hand, yet they're communicating. Um, they're, um, you know, you get to think of things like, you know, queuing theory or network theory, like computer networks, how those operate. Um, you know, there's lags, um, there's almost queuing theory. Um, there's a number of different approaches which uh, may be beneficial um, to uh, the understanding of, of these networks and then modeling them uh, at large. Were there any other ideas that people wanted to share? Hey Jack, I, I'm not. A, I don't do the development of the fundamentals of the network analysis, but I'm certainly an end user, and I've used this in the past to interpret um, biomechanical response um, in the context of TBI and potentially yeah. disrupting the network and what that may mean functionally. Um, I think one of the important things that should be considered while you're putting this together is integrating these essentially tools with the end use. Uh, and end users. Um, and I think that's, that kind of forms that bigger picture holistic approach of, of the value of doing this type of analysis or other type of computational neuroscience. Um, it's, it's just not about developing fundamental ways of assessing the network in this case, but it's how that development will further um, existing clinical problems. Um, and so I think that needs to be a key component of, of what you're proposing here is, is integrating this technology with, with people who actually really need to use it to solve their problems. I um, think that's really- no, Absolutely. Important. That is like, um, as, as a theoretician, I just wanna say, this is extremely important to use, um, I'll just call it uh, problem-facing fundamental research. It is really important um, that it do that, otherwise it just, yeah, it's useless. It becomes but, academic but, rather than well. That, absolutely, so many times you you know bless the 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 hearts of you know a lot of my good friends who de develop algorithms, largely you know they're bless their hearts computer scientists who really develop algorithms to impress other computer scientists <laughs> instead of them being something which can be a tool that somebody who's working in a clinical domain like traumatic brain injury for example you want to understand what the effect of you know, a lesion in a particular area of the brain has network wide, if yeah. the tool can't be used by that clinician or that researcher, you know, why are you using it? Um, or why was it developed? And it becomes like you say, it's an academic issue rather than one that's actually functionally useful. Yeah, um, what, I, I, think, I think that's given that this is, you know, there's these, these grant challenges have had problem areas and then tools, essentially yeah. neuroimaging is one and, and certainly computational uh, neuroscience is one. And I think there needs to be in the importance of linking those uh, those things together. Absolutely. And that was this sort of um, just recapitulates my comment from when we were kind of all getting together was that the computational end of things really links all of these different grand challenge um, themes like these areas. And we're, again, we're collecting tons and tons of data. I always like to tell the story of when I was a graduate student or rather a newly minted postdoctoral fellow, I went out and bought the hard disk for our laboratory and it was four gigabytes. And I thought that was infinity. And you know, now we can eat four gigabytes you know, in a morning, that's nothing. Um, and so very likely we'll be collecting still more data, not only locally, but also as we you know, maybe participate in these other challenges or um, the areas where um, uh, we can participate in um, say national or international uh, partnerships to, to gather data. So that, that needs to look uh, you know, both within computation, but across these different thematic areas as well. Thank you for anybody who had to, had to depart. It uh, looks like Greg has his hand up, Greg. Hey everybody. Um, one of the things I was thinking about kind of tying in with Matt's comment was I do more work in the peripheral nervous system and um, you know where that ends and where the um, central nervous system begins. Uh, I think there's questions related to that. And also even in the peripheral nervous system, there's auxiliary structures which shape the beginnings of the inputs. Um, so I'm like, where to draw the line exactly? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm just bringing up that uh, you know topic because I think the 
beginning inputs um, also can be awesome, viewed as a network Greg. as well. Yeah, uh, Greg, that's awesome, and it, it's uh, it, it. I have a personal interest in that. I published a paper earlier this year called "Mapping the Rest of the Connectome," which was uh, realizing that uh, while well, a lot of money and effort went into mapping everything kind of above the neck in terms of the connectome, is that uh, the peripheral nervous system, spinal cord, and um, uh, various other structures below the neck uh, have been neglected in the, the mapping of the connectome, and so peripheral nervous system, spinal cord. Um, enteric nervous system, um, you know, various uh, the the gut brain axis, all those things could be potentially very very important for us to participate in. You know, it's it um, those if you view this computationally, this is an example <clears throat> of distributed controls and distributed computation. Uh, networks are essential to represent them in the first place, and uh, and also actuators are sort of important to the. Uh, mind, brain, you know, mind and body, whatever connection. So I, I think this is great, but I just have, and I think it has to be there because it's, it's not separate. It's not a different thing. It's all part of the nervous system. <clears throat> but I would just say that so is interaction among humans. And so is interaction between humans um, and increasingly intelligent information processing. And I, I, I wonder if the scope of applications is medical, uh, is delimited to medical applications or if it can include um, these extended mind kind of uh, interactions, social. You know, I, I wonder about that too. I know um, Teague has dabbled a little bit in this. I believe he also has his hand raised. Uh, Teague, did you have a comment? Oh, um, uh, this is a, a, a topic that, that I think a lot of folks are, are touching on. But um, one thing that I'm always concerned about is can the data that we collect support the methods that we want to use? Right, and so what we, we've talked about this, um, oh, in two minutes, it will close. Uh, we've talked about this in terms of like integrating tools. Well, if you develop an algorithm for like causal inference that requires a certain frequency of sampling, you can't apply that to data that is sampled at a less um, intense frequency. I mean, this comes up a lot in fMRI research where we're trying to get causal inference about brain activity but we don't take into account differential HRF functions in, in different areas. So I, I think it's, it's very, very important that we also think about kind of what the data that we have or are able to collect as a field and also at UVA allows us to then look at, allows us to then kind of test and develop our tools. And, and, and this touches on the peripheral nervous system as well. I'm, I'm not familiar with kind of how um, uh, that data is collected, um, but allowing us to, to collect the necessary aspects of the data to further the development of our methods, I think is an important topic to consider. Absolutely. Um, again, here we just have about a minute or so to go. One thing which I think is, again, probably going to be important is that uh, the NIH and the NSF at various times come up with programs that look at, uh, like, for example, emergent networks coming you know, naturally out of uh, natural systems. Um, I know that Teague and, and Heeman have uh, uh, put in a grant for uh, a, um, a mechanism to, through the NSF. NIH comes up with these all the time. Uh, I would like to see all of this stuff help make us more competitive for those grants when they come up. So it looks like they're going to boot us out of here in about 15 seconds. So just real quickly, it looks like we have multi-layer modeling, multiplexing model, basically data integration across different modalities, applying theoretical computer science and causal descriptions in a number of different ways. And peripheral nervous system is cool and how we can support the methods. 